the Italian Alps, great mountains, but also great geology, including remarkable metamorphic rocks. Their combination of minerals record how deeply buried these rocks once were. In this way, they behave rather like weather stations, which record temperature and pressure changes in the meteorology. Well, metamorphic minerals do the same thing for rocks. So for geologists, metamorphic rocks are really important for understanding the tectonics of mountain belts. Nice garnets. So off to the heart of the Western Alps, onto the flanks of Val Tanange. Just south of the Swiss border. Our walk takes us out of the valley, up to a reservoir, the Lago de Chigliana. We'll stop at the lake, then push on up a little bit further. So it becomes a bit of a transect. So I'm off up into some really classic geology. Up the top of this hill here, better get cracking. It's a bit of a pull, but it's a nice walk. And it takes us up through a slab of former oceanic crust, once part of the seabed that separated Europe from a continental fragment called Apulia, largely the modern day Italian peninsula. And it was the collision between these continental blocks that formed the Alps. And for us, it's the fate of the old oceanic crust that we're off to discover. A history recorded by the geology. Made it, but no time to stop off at the refugio. The geology's calling. So this is Lago Chignana, Chignana Lake. And we've come here to look at these rocks here. They're famous for alpine geology and indeed world geology. So I'll just take my rucksack off and we can have an explore around these outcrops together. We'll start off looking at rocks that were once basalts and gabbros. So some fairly classic textures here. We've got these dark bands in the surrounding material. And these are, well the dark color is because of the amphibole Glaucophane, it's the blue amphibole. And the material around here, the green color, is the pyroxene omphacite and jadeite. And sprinkled across both of these are studs of garnet. So we've got classic mineralogy here of Echogites, high pressure metamorphism. These are our key minerals that we can see here at outcrop. The dark blue glaucophane, the green minerals, omphacite and jadeite, and the studs of garnet. So what does this mean? Well, here's a plot of pressure or depth against temperature. In most parts of the continents, this is a typical geothermal gradient. Rocks get hotter with depth. In classic metamorphic studies, it's the different aluminium silicates that are used, andalusite, silimonite, and kyanite, to chart the different conditions around this geotherm. But not here. We're a long, long way into the kyanite stability field. 
Here's another reaction line, the feldspar albite, jadeite plus quartz, which is one of the minerals we have here. And along with the garnet and omphacite, put us in the eclogite field. The pressure temperature conditions imply a geotherm like this. So we call this high pressure metamorphism because the pressure is so much greater than the temperature we might expect at these depths for a normal geothermal gradient. Minerals partition elements differently between them. Comparing the iron magnesium ratios in garnet and omphacite places us here. Well, that's a classic approach using the main minerals in the eclogite. But in the early 1990s, the petrologist Thomas Reinecke made a remarkable discovery looking at inclusions inside the garnet crystals. Well, beyond the mineralogy that we can identify here in hand specimen, the glaucophane, omphacite and garnet, which tells us that these rocks have been to eclogite fasces, that's high pressure metamorphism. But actually, there's a surprise if you look inside the garnets in thin section and you find the mineral coazite. That's the high pressure polymorph of silica. The conventional one, you know, is quartz. And that tells us that these rocks have been very deeply buried indeed, well over 100 kilometers down in the earth. And there's more. Inclusions too of diamond, just a few microns across. And this is where those transformations occur on our plot. So these are the conditions of our rocks at Chinyana. The oceanic crust has been buried to way over 100 kilometers down in the earth. And that means subduction. The oceanic crust has been subducted down into the upper mantle. So it's not just mafic igneous rocks in here. They're these banded units, which are made of sediments. And they've got some really nice mega clasts in them. Look at this. So a really big mafic clast. It's got that green tinge. And that's the omphacite. So, a lump in there that's experienced high pressure metamorphism. But let's just check out what's happened in the meta sediments. And the garnets are the giveaway, really fresh garnets in here, which also say that this has been to the same high pressure conditions as that lump. So, these two have been to high pressure metamorphic conditions. And if we follow this uh, layer with that large lump along, we find another couple here, and then a larger one. Unfortunately, somebody's drilled this out to look at the chemistry, but you can see here's our mafic lump, and there's a reaction rim around it here against the surrounding metasediments. So this shows metamorphic regression, the breakdown of eclogite mineral assemblages, the reactions concentrating where there's diverse chemistry from the sediments and the mafic block. These are indications of lower pressure metamorphic conditions after the high pressure ones. So we can build up a history Initially burial, that's subduction, going up pressure. Then retrogression or exhumation assemblages imply these conditions. So this is a milestone on the return of our oceanic crust from the subduction zone back towards the Earth's surface. Remarkably little of the eclogite here has retrogressed. Peak minerals are frozen in, but they are veins of albite. These have been formed at lower pressures than for the jadeite stability field, with green schist reaction rims on the margins against the metastable eclogite.
Selecolytes, high pressure metamorphism with coazite and microdiamond. Nowadays we call this ultra high pressure metamorphism. Preserved metastably as the former oceanic crust came back towards the Earth's surface from down in a subduction zone. But now it's time to continue our journey. We'll leave the area around the refugio and walk to the head of the lake. We'll cross out of the Eclogites, passing through a tract of serpentinite, that's former oceanic mantle rocks, that overlook the dam. So we're leaving those high pressure oceanic rocks behind and we're moving on to the head of the lake and we'll find some more really spectacular rocks up there. Well, that's where our outcrops are, over by that rather quaint little chapel lunchtime, so the picnickers are beginning to get established. So these are the rocks we've come over to see. So these are pretty dramatic calc marlinites, or highly sheared marbles. If we scuff around on some of these surfaces here, we might even find a stretching lineation. Ah oh, yes, here we go. Well, let's measure it up. So here's the lineation coming down like this. So we just simply measure it like that. Okay, so it's plunging this way, just slightly west of north. So we crossed into meta sediments and to see more, it's up another few hundred meters to outcrops up on the ridge that overlooks the lake. So, not much outcrop in the valley, but the rocks that lie above those marbles are these really spectacular rocks. So these are, well, schists and carbonates, calc schists if you like, essentially myelinitic, but stratigraphically these started life as Jurassic marine sediments. And now they're pretty blitzed. In less deformed areas this formation turns out to be a boulder bed, limestone conglomerates, which gives you an idea of the strain intensity here. So moving off these Jurassic calc shifts, this is more or less the end of our transect, but it's not the end of the geology. The hills up there behind me are another unit again, a unit called the Austroalpine Naps. It's actually part of a so-called Dom Blanche Clipper, and it lies on top, not only of these uh, calc schists and the marbles, but of course also on top of the Eclogites and other rocks between them as well. So I'm gonna get back down now and 
go back down to that chapel and draw a cross section to show how these things all relate. So this is a convenient viewpoint and a convenient cross section, that hillside, which takes us up from the Eckergeites on the far side of the lake there, up the hillside, all the way up to the Austro-Alpine rocks that lie on the crest of the ridge. So let's just sketch that up. So there we are, different units stacked up, one on top of the other. The interesting thing here is that the Echelgeites, obviously, they're high pressure rocks, ultra high pressure rocks, but everything beyond the Serpentinite, well, that never saw high pressure metamorphism. So we have a contact there that represents a pressure break we can put this onto our pressure temperature plot, the Eclogites, the lower rocks in our transect, and the return path recorded by their retrogression. The upper rocks only record these conditions at metamorphic peak, so there's a big difference in the peak pressure recorded across that tectonic contact, equating to a depth difference of around 75 kilometers. So we have a story where the oceanic crust starts off and is subducted down deep into the earth, into the upper mantle at around at least 100 kilometers down. And then it's come back up, not by eroding this material, but by being juxtaposed against rocks that never went deeply down the subduction zone. Well, we'll explore how that plays out in another video. And that episode involves that mountain over there, the Matterhorn. <laughs>